Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, JC is uh, the founder and CEO of Costai, a French startup, and he's going to present the Urbi framework. Uh, let me just remind you that this talk will be on YouTube, and as such, please, nothing confidential. Thank you. OK. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the Herbie script language mainly, and in general about robotics, which is the main application for Herbie. And as such, I would like to start with a little bit of background on where we come from and what is Gostai and what I'm doing there. Uh, we're coming from academic research. I did a PhD in a Sony Computer Science Lab where I first discovered uh, robotics. And my main interest was in uh, artificial intelligence, so trying to make these uh, robots more lifelike, interesting, surprising, and so on. So that's where it all started, uh, when I had to program the, this robot in particular, and then later on other types of robots. And I discovered that it was very difficult to do so, usually with C++ and traditional methods of programming, where you had robots with uh, uh, tens or hundreds of models that you had to control, and all those things in parallel, and react to events, and all those things. So I decided first to build Erby as a way to make these things easier, so with a clear focus on simplicity, because I had students there that, uh, at that time that were coming for a two-month internship, and they were spending one month knowing how to move a motor of this robot. So the, the first focus was on simplicity, and the second was was the second one was on flexibility. So trying to make uh, these tools as uh, flexible and usable with any uh, other technologies that are currently used in robotics or other domains in general. So these are the two uh, historical keywords that we kept. Uh, as uh, I founded the company two years ago, to grow this technology into a product and then try to address the, the current issues of robotics. But um, if I try to summarize what is RB, uh, I think we can go beyond robotics and say that it's basically a platform to handle complex and parallel systems, uh, which includes uh, four things that I'm going to describe, as I said, with a clear focus on the language, but also not only. There's a component architecture, which is called UObject, that allows you to connect components to Erby and extend it, basically. So I will, I will come again on that later. Uh, there are interfaces, I will not talk about that, but there are interfaces to C++, Java, MATLAB. That's all what we have so far, but uh, there is no issue to extending this to Python or other languages. There's a language that I'm going to talk mainly today about, and the Urbi Studio uh, uh, IDE. Uh, maybe I will have time to make a demo, so I show you what we've built on top of Urbi as a higher level abstractions to develop behaviors for robots, or maybe also to, for video games. There's a clear uh, connection between the two domains. Um, so just to uh, set up the landscape, the idea of Erby is to try to make all robots uh, compatible and easy to program and to use. So that's the, 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 well, the, the, the clear focus of the company. There are, uh, maybe you don't know that, but there are hundreds of different robots coming on the market, mainly from Japan, Korea, but also from the US uh, or for Europe, from Europe. And all these robots are today completely incompatible on top of being very complex to program most of the time. And Erby has an ambition to try to make all these robots uh, speaking the same language if you want and uh, making the life of programmers much easier. So that's the, 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 the ambition. Okay, um, so let's have first a quick overview with a typical uh, sample program from Erby uh, that is kind of summarizing uh, what you what you find that is really new in the language and that makes it interesting. I'm talking about the Urbi script language. So it's a short video and I'm going to make the uh, live demo at the same time. So the idea is a very typical uh, behavior for a robot. You have ball tracking. So you have a robot and you want it to uh, follow a red ball in the image. Uh, there are, of course, many ways to do that. Uh, the point is not that uh, Erby is the only way you can do such a thing. It's a very cl classical example. Uh, the interesting thing is how you do this. And uh, so in terms of productivity, how fast you can do things, how easily you can debug them. So this is the example of the, the small Erby script uh, program that is uh, making this behavior happening, what you've just seen. So I'm going to run the, this thing here. Oh. So you see, this is how it works. So, oh, it's very interested by the red uh, <laughs> uh, uh, 
chairs there. So it's basically detecting the red color in the image. There's nothing interesting in the vision processing, of course, that's not the point. So as you probably have uh, understood by reading this, uh, the idea is that you have a script here which says, whenever I see the ball, I'm going to move the head toward my head towards the ball. So that's the, the basically what you can guess from what you read. Uh, and if you look a bit more into the details, there are uh, three things that are illustrated in this script. That's why it's a good example to, to, to start. Uh, there is this whenever thing, which is uh, the illustration of how well, one of the ways you can do even programming in RB. Basically, it says, whenever the condition is true, execute the code behind, uh, below, uh, in a loop. And as long as the condition is true, do it again. And well, it, when it's not true, you stop doing that. And when it's true again, you do it again. So that, the idea is that it's like a while. But the big difference here is that it's, it, it kind of detaches itself and runs in the background. And it's always there, ready to fire whenever the condition is true. So here you have uh, clearly event-based programming. You react to events. We will see in another slide that other tools to do uh, event programming in Erby. But you have something also that is implicit here is already is parallelism. Because if you have hundreds of uh, whenever like that in your, in your code, and if they trigger at the same time because the condition is true, well, then the code has to execute in parallel, of course. So that's the, the obviously a requirement. So what you have here is ex uh, implicit parallelism. And what you find in this example also is explicit parallelism with this uh, and symbol here. Of course, you recognize the semicolon, which has the traditional meaning of uh, you know, a sequential ordering of, of uh, commands. But with the and symbol, you can basically say that you want the two pieces of code to be executed in parallel or starting exactly at the same time. So that's exactly what we want here, because the headpan motor is this, this guy. And the head tilt motor is this guy. <laughs> no. And uh, we want them to move uh, in parallel. We don't want the, the head to do this, but we want the head to do this. Well, yes, he agrees. Uh, so the, the point is that um, we could have put a semicolon, but the, the idea is to express the fact that we want those two movements to happen at the same time. The third thing that is extremely important that you have to uh, remember uh, is the fact that the language is extendable with clear uh, connections to C++. So if you look at the ball object here, of course in a, it's an object in Erby script, so it's an object-oriented language, you can define objects and so on. But in that particular case, this object is written in C++. So you write the C++ vision algorithm, you know, basically to detect the, the ball in the image, extract the red pixels and so on, doesn't matter. You write this in C++ because you expect speed and you expect this to be very fast, and then you plug it inside Erby. And so you have your object, which is in C++, that appears in Erby script, and you can start to use this object inside your scripts and make it interact with other objects in, par in a parallel or even driven way. So this is a very important thing. It's called uObject. So it's a library in C++. You take your, your, C, your C++ class, your favorite class. You make it inherit from uObject. You do one or two changes in the constructor. So it's a re really simple uh, things you do. And then once you compile it, you can plug it in, in Erby. There's a second way, by the way, that you can uh, plug the object. What I just mentioned here is hard linking to the, the interpreter of the language. But you can also unplug it and run it as a remote process that will be running on a remote computer and will do the connection over the network and all is done transparently. So you don't really uh, care or you don't know whether ball is inside the robot or inside the application, if you want to extend that to other domains, uh, or if it is running on a remote computer, which can be running uh, Linux, Windows, or whatever. Uh, so, oh, thank you, Mr. Robot. Um, the idea behind this is that Erby is an orchestrator that is going to coordinate components, as I just said, so C++ classes that you have plugged, and make this job of coordination in an event, uh, uh, event based and parallel uh, way. Uh, in that sense, it's very close to the approach that you probably uh, know about video games, where you have more and more today, typically, uh, this is an example of World of Warcraft, you have a LUA script or you have another scripting language like Python also, that is used to uh, script the behavior, the logic of the game, so what the game is supposed to do, uh, to express the high level things about the game. And on the side, of course, you have C++ for rendering, pathfinding, animations, and so on. And so you clearly separate the logic on one side, which is the job of a script language, and the heavy duty calculation, which is uh, handled by C++ or something else. Uh, so, so this is exactly the same approach we have with Erby. Uh, the difference is, uh, on the script language side, we add some capabilities for handling uh, parallelism and even based programming. 
Of course, inside Erby, as you can guess, there is a, uh, um, there's a scheduler that is capable of scheduling all these commands in parallel. So it's a little bit like a small operating system in some sense. OK, uh, this is a, a reminder to summarize the, the, what I just said about the U objects and so on. Uh, the thing you have to know also is that the classical way of handling uh, an interaction with Ruby is to open a socket and you know you just open a telnet to the robot or to your application. So it's a client server architecture. You open a connection and you send some code that is executed. This brings a lot of flexibility. That's how you can connect anything to Ruby and connect your existing programs or your graphical interfaces, whatever you like, to the, the, the main uh, uh, central system. And so as I said, you can hard link some new objects or you can use a TCP IP connection here to use some uh, remote new object in C++. For the remote mode, we also have support for Java, which is uh, an extension. We, we plan to add more languages in the future. And the, the other one, C++ Java MATLAB, is through the LibRB, which is basically a template inside your favorite language. So it opens the sockets, sends commands, and passes the result of the messages that you get in return. OK, so as I say, I'd like to focus on the Ruby script language. I think this might be interesting for you. I'd like to have your feedback also on this. Uh, since we mainly evolve in the robotic world, I think this uh, is interesting to see what you guys uh, may have to say about it. Um, the main facts about Ruby script, uh, you already see I made the distinction between Ruby, which is the platform that in, uh, includes you know, U objects and also some tools and so on, and the, the language itself, which is at the heart of it. Uh, but so the language itself is a dynamic script language. As I said, it has parallel and even driven semantics embedded in the language. The object model is inspired by IO and self. So it's on the, you know, the script language side is very similar to things you're familiar to. I'm not going to talk about that. It's uh, well, what you expect more or less. And what is really new and interesting is the parallel and even driven things. Uh, as I said also, it's very important to understand there is strong binding to C++. Of course, you cannot write everything in Ruby. It doesn't make sense. It's a script language, so you need to connect it to other uh, languages. Uh, another point that is very interesting and important is that it's an easy syntax that is inspired by known languages. So the learning curve is not like uh, you have to learn a completely alien stuff. Uh, uh, you know, it's a familiar thing, except for the new uh, syntax that uh, handles parallelism or, or events. Um, so there are, uh, I think, to start with is to mention the four ways they, that exist in Ruby to separate the uh, expressions evaluation. So as you have seen already, there are two that we have seen in the first example, the traditional semicolon and the and symbol. And actually, there are four ways. So there's also a comma and a pipe. So let's have a look at what they do exactly. Uh, the semicolon is doing, just like in any language, the classical thing. So you have A, and later on, when A is over, you start to do B. But there might be a gap, so there is no guarantee in the semantics. And in particular, if the scheduler wants to schedule B later, because there are some other things that are more important to do, it might do so. If you want to prevent that, uh, there is this syntax A pipe B, which basically means that uh, the, the, the end of uh, A is, uh, is, uh, is going to be connected to the uh, beginning of, of B, and there should be no gap. So it's a way to uh, make them as an atom of, of uh, execution, and you cannot, the scheduler cannot split them and, and uh, put something in between. This is very important in robotics when you want to coordinate movements of the arm of a robot, for example, and you want to specify that things should be following uh, uh, exactly one uh, another. Um, so these are serial operators. On the parallel side, we are already have seen the A and B. So they basic, B, basically, it means that A and B should start exactly at the same time. So it's a very strong constraint. Again, very useful for specifying things in robotics. And you have the A, uh, comma B, which uh, basically, well, you see the idea, it's a gap again, so it's kind of loose version of the previous one. Uh, the, the intuitive uh, understanding of what it does is to put A in background. So you have a big thing that uh, A is doing, like it's taking a lot of time, and you want to detach it, so you don't want to block the flow of execution. Instead of putting a semicolon, you will put a comma, and then it's going to basically detach it because even if it's not over, and if you throw a B after that, B is going to start. As soon as B is ready, it's going to start. So it has the you know, impli uh, well, intuitive meaning of detaching. It's not exactly like detach, but this is going too much into uh, technical details and uh, 
Maybe uh, if you want, we can discuss that later with questions. So that's about parallelism and even based pro uh, parallelism, and that's about even based programming. There are three uh, examples. So we've seen already whenever there's an only if construct that says basically when the test is not true, then uh, execute something else. Uh, you may think of it as a while that is detaching and executing uh, forever. Uh, the little uh, uh, drawing illustrates the idea that. Uh, you're going to loop A and loop B as long as the test is true or false. And you have the more, um, I would say, state transition version, the more even based uh, version of whenever, which is at. And at a test, B is going to execute A only once when the test becomes true. So it switches from false to true. And uh, you have an else construct to uh, say what happens when the test uh, switches to, to false again. So these are two very uh, basic, you can think of it as a if that is detaching in some, some sense. So these are the two basic tools that you can use to uh, program uh, events in, in Erby. Uh, there's another one, a very simple one, which is wait until a test. As you can expect, it's going to block until the test is true. And then if you do a pipe, remember, there shouldn't be no gap in between. So it means that uh, pipe A, uh, it means that A is going to execute right after the fact that test is true again. So this can be used very easily to make some uh, synchronization points in several threads of codes. Uh, you want them to stop all uh, uh, waiting for some condition. And as soon as the condition is true, they will all start exactly at the same time in, in parallel. Well, what I mean by exactly at the same time, as you can guess, is a little bit complicated. But uh, the idea is that it's going to start very quickly at the same time, depending on what support you have for multiprocessors and things like that. Um, on the side of events, also, you have constructs like uh, pure events that you can emit, like emit my event, emit my event with some uh, parameters that you attach to the event. So later on, you can catch this event with the at, for example, or whenever. And if you want to um, get the, the, the value of the, the parameters of your event, if there are such, such uh, things, you can use this syntax to say that you want to instantiate x and y, and then use it in uh, the, the code that follows the, the event catcher. Uh, you can, of course, also filter based on this. So you can say, at my event 1 and s, means everything that starts with 1 and anything else afterwards. So it, this is a tool that you can use to filter based on uh, uh, se certain values on the, the, the the event uh, parameters. Uh, you can e emit an event for a certain duration. So events are not just points. They can be uh, d uh, well, uh, things that last for a, a certain time. Uh, you can have this type of construct, which are extremely useful and maybe something very fundamental in the language, I think, which is uh, every two seconds execute some code. Here again, you have implicit parallelism. If the code that you have behind is lasting for more than two seconds, it's going to superimpose to itself and there is no problem with that. It's, uh, it's completely handled by the language. Uh, a typical example is to pulse an, an, an event here every two seconds, emit my event. So that's an um, uh, illustration of, well, some of the things you can do on the event side of the, the language. OK, uh, another thing is this very useful construct for robotics. Uh, the idea here is for the first line, neck equal 10 times 450 uh, milliseconds. You should reach the value 10 starting from wherever you are. So in the example, uh, in the upper right side, you see that it starts from the value minus 2. And you do this in a linear way, and it takes 450 milliseconds. So this is generating a trajectory, and the assignment lasts for that amount of time, lasts for 450 milliseconds. So if you put uh, 10 things like that one after the other, it's going to take 4.5 uh, seconds. Well, you get the idea. The, the duration of the, the, the assignment is a real thing. And if you want to detach that, you should end it with a comma so that your flow of execution is not uh, uh, impacted by the, the duration. Another example here uh, is leg, where you, we use the speed modifier to assign a certain speed to reach the value. Uh, and the last one is an interesting one. It just oscillates around the value of 14 with a given amplitude and, and a given period. Four seconds. So this, of course, never terminates. So it's, think of it uh, uh, as the equivalent of a while true. Uh, so you better end it with a comma, otherwise uh, your program ends there, and that's the last thing that is going to be executed. Uh, I say your program, but you must remember you can open many connections to the same robot. So there's not such thing as the program. There are hundreds of different uh, pieces of code running in parallel. That's the way it's uh, usually done in, in uh, uh, applications with Erby. 
Um, so, of course, this is very useful for robotics. Not sure it's useful in general, but for robotics, it enables to design uh, complex movements for robots in a very uh, simple way. So as I said, uh, you should use a comma at the end. Uh, this is another interesting thing, uh, the blending mode. So you have a way to say what happens when you're accessing the same resource at the same time. So you're trying to uh, assign different uh, uh, sinusoidal assignments to the variable x. So what happens? So you have the classical way of mutexing these things. So you have a one only that can access the resource at a time. So this is a blend mode equal Q. But you have other types of blending, uh, other types of blend modes available, like mix, which is basically going to make the average of the concurrent access to the variable, which could be used in a robot, for example, as a way to superimpose signals sent to the same motor uh, that comes from a Fourier transform, for example, uh, that you know will reproduce a periodic signal. And it's an easy, convenient way of doing this. And in general, I think it's something we're still working on. It's a very difficult topic. It's complex. And, uh, but it could be an interesting uh, way to be an alternative to mutexes and have a more general vision of, uh, on this, because the language knows about concurrent access. So it has some smart way to handle it. And it's not always the only thing you want to do, which is to queue or, or have a, you know, uh, an error that, uh, that is thrown. Uh, there could be some other cases, typically in robotics, where you want to mix those things and make sense of it. Uh, okay. And the last thing I want to talk about is maybe it deserves a big screen because it's maybe one of the most important features of Ruby, and um, maybe the most significant and most original one of all uh, is the tags. The idea is extremely, extremely simple. It's the fact that uh, you write some code and you detach it. So maybe I should use a, a comma instead of a semicolon in my example. Uh, but then you name it. So you put a tag in front of it. So you use my tag, whatever you want. And then later on, in another part of your program, or when a certain event triggers, or well, I don't know when, but you can at any time stop this piece of code if it's not already uh, stopped, so it's still running, by using uh, 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 my tag stop, which is going to stop this code. Uh, you can also freeze it, so you temporarily uh, stop the, execu the execution of the code, and then later on you can unfreeze it, so it resumes where it was. And so this uh, allows to really uh, give the Herbie the, the possibility to make his job as a, an orchestrator and do his job as you know starting this, you wait, you start, and when that happens, you do this and this in parallel and so on. So it's very important. It's a very important feature that you can name your code when it's running in parallel. Because if you think of it, when you start to have hundreds of threads, you want to act on these things. Uh, you have to objectify those, those lines of code so that you can handle them later on. And we plan also to add more things on the tags uh, capabilities, not only to flow, stop, uh, freeze, and so on, but also to, to control the level of priority, to, so to interact with the scheduler, and so to use these tags to be the, 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 the point of entry to act upon the code that is running. So there are a lot of things we, we can do with that, including also debugging features. I will show you some example. The tag, the tag knows when the code is starting and when it's stopping. And this can be used to signal uh, interesting information by emitting events that you can catch and that you can integrate in your program. Uh, there's also uh, a feature that is hierarchical tags. So you can structure my tag, dot sub tag, dot sub sub tag. And using this, you can have uh, more elaborate ways of uh, organizing your code into a tree. And of course, if you do my tag dot stop, you're going to stop everything that is my tag dot uh, star. So anything that is starting with my tag. And so you have a tree of tags, and your code is, is cleverly put at different levels, depending on where it, it should be. This is a very, very, very useful uh, uh, tool. The last thing about tags is um, when you stop the evaluation of an expression, well, it was supposed to return something. Right? It was supposed to evaluate to something. So if you don't want it to evaluate to void, which is what is going to happen if you use the first uh, syntax I've shown, uh, you can use uh, my tag that stop and, and add the value. Uh, as a uh, parameter. So this is going to stop the, the, the evaluation of the expression and return the value, which is a very important and useful feature also. OK, so uh, let's start VI, if nobody is against it. And we're going to see some code samples. Uh, how much time do I have? I think we can afford that, uh, because it might be a little bit long, or maybe I'm going to go quickly. I want you to show you some. Uh, 
uh, real code examples because this is the main ideas I explained. So what makes Erby a new approach, something interesting? Uh, yes, we've designed a new language, which is uh, something uh, like a heresy. We should never do that. But I think we really had a point at making this language and embedding these abstractions on parallelism and even based programming that are used every day, all the time in every program you do in robots and I guess in many other uh, domains. So the idea is to integrate this abstraction in the language and so that, that's the, the reason why it was uh, maybe not such a bad idea to design a new language. But I want you to have a look at what it, it looks uh, a real example. So this is uh, how it, it, it's uh, happening when I interact directly with, uh, uh, you know, I turn it to the, the, the Erby engine and I get this, this line. So I'm creating a variable and evaluate it. What you can see on this is that the value is returned with something before, we call it the, the header, and it's the time. It gives you the time when the value has been evaluated. Again, this is absolutely uh, necessary in robotics. When you ask for the value of a motor, you don't really care of the value if you don't know when it was uh, uh, this value was true. Uh, the other way that you, you can also, well, the other feature that we need when we try to really use it with the robot is the notion of channel, so this is the last line. Uh, it's a simple way to um, append to the, the header uh, it's a string that will help you on the other side, on the client side, uh, will help you to sort what you get uh, according to what you have requested before. Imagine if you request the value of the motors of this robot, I think there are 20, I don't know, 24 or something, anyway. Uh, you get a lot of streams of value back to your client and you don't know which one is the leg, which one is the head. So the idea is to use these channels to uh, sort on the other side based on the channel name and then dispatch to the appropriate code that should handle the, the value. So these are very practical things that uh, are useful and necessary when you really use the system, uh, at least in robotics. My Chan, yeah. Uh, this is an, uh, an example I just mentioned before of the tags used as a debugging tool. Uh, the syntax may evolve, we are still working on the, the syntax itself, but the idea is that uh, you can have uh, some tags that uh, are, are uh, customized if you want so that they can uh, uh, send, a stream, uh, send a string, emit some message when the, the code that they are attached to is starting and when it is stopping. So that's what we did with the begin and end tag. And so basically you have these kind of things. When the code starts, at some point you get this uh, message with the, the tag, uh, it belongs to the main tag. Uh, as, a, as a header, as part of the header. So think of it as, as a customized channel. But anyway, you get the information that it begins and it ends. And this is extremely useful to uh, design applications that monitors what's happening in the robot, so design debuggers. It's a very simple idea again, but it's, it's proven to be uh, uh, extremely useful. Uh, some other things, uh, interruptible functions. Uh, so this might be a, a bit strange, but the idea is that at, when you enter the function, you put some at that says, um, well, if uh, the value of x or whatever you want actually uh, happens to be that, then uh, interrupt whatever you're doing and return that as a, an exit value, and that's it. Then you do your calculation, you manipulate x and you whatever, and this function is supposed to return uh, x plus x plus 1 uh, uh, multiplied by 2. So that, that goes very well for 1 and 10, as you can see. But 41, it get, gets somehow interrupted at the second stage because uh, 41 plus 1 is 42. So the at, which is always running, remember it's in the background, it interrupts the, the execution and returns a value at, at that moment. So this is very convenient. Well, the other example shows uh, uh, the, 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 the case of a negative value. So this is a way to have interruptible functions and to handle some uh, unexpected uh, uh, events or whatever you want. Um, another thing is, well, the, the use of lambda functions, so you can, well, it's just to mention that this exists in the language, so you can define functions like a, a function uh, uh, that takes no name but one parameter and returns uh, the value of x uh, plus, plus uh, the value of the parameter. Uh, and then, well, you can use this kind of function and apply it on the, the on the, on the list. So this is basically to show you what is the family of the language, what kind of uh, you know, taste it has. So it's nothing new again, there's nothing uh, particularly uh, original, but it shows you uh, the look of you know, what you can do with the syntax. 
what is this? So this is um, well lazy evaluation of uh, uh, parameters for a function. So you get uh, the, this this uh, function is very simple. It just executes a block of code until a certain value gets true. So uh, the the function just evaluate uh, the second uh, 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 sorry uh, the second argument. So yes, and while uh, it's not uh, while the first uh, argument is not true, then it carries on and executes it again. So it's uh, like a, a loop, uh, but you have written it in pure RB. So what you see here is lazy evaluation. So you can take uh, uh, an expression that is transmitted to the function as a, as a parameter and evaluate it later on. So you don't have the value of this expression on the right, but you have the expression itself. Once again, this is not especially new. It's just to show you what you can do with the language. Uh, so transmitting expressions unevaluated to functions. And that this can be used to redesign your, your language in some, some sense. Um, this is an interesting use of, of tags to show you what you can do with it. So the idea is that you are going to uh, define a function that uh, executes, the, um, well, yeah, executes the first uh, argument, uh, but it's going to be interrupted after the time given as the second uh, argument. So when the second argument is uh, when the time exceeds the second argument, it's going to stop whatever uh, is happening. It's going to stop the execution of the, the code. So you can think of it as a timeout. So timeout some time, and you put some code that is going to be executed. And it has some limits of time to, to run. So we define the local tag, T. So we use it then to uh, 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 store the whole program, that, well, the whole content of the function. And we do in parallel, as you can see with the end symbol, we're going to do two things in parallel. Evaluate the first argument, which is uh, what is inside the stop uh, uh, parameter uh, that you see, t dot stop. And at the same time, we are going to sleep for the time given in the second argument. And once we are over sleeping, when it's over, we're going to stop t. And so this returns void. Uh, but if the second one is, uh, uh, well, if the, the, the argument one is finishing before the time given in the second argument, then uh, it's going to be uh, used as the value to stop t, but return that value at the same time. Remember, t dot stop and the value stops t and uh, returns the value as a, the result of the evaluation of whatever was tagged by, by t. So this can be used as a, this example. So we, we sleep two seconds and we have three seconds time, so it's OK. It's going up to 42. But if we do the opposite, we want to sleep two seconds, and but we have only one second of time, then it's returning void. Interesting use of tags and, and local tags that are local to your uh, function. Uh, this might get a little bit complicated, but the only thing you have to look at here is that we have a function f that takes a tag as an argument. So you can pass a tag to somebody that knows nothing about yourself, and he is going to be able to interrupt you because he has a tag that can use as a handle to, to do something. So in that example, the function f basically returns uh, the square uh, of, uh, of x. Uh, but if it's 42, then, well, no. It's going to abort and return 32 instead of uh, 42 uh, multiplied by 42. Uh, and so this uh, function is called to do the multiplication of a series of value in a, in a list. Uh, but if ever you have a 42 in your list, then it's going to stop the execution and return uh, the, the current uh, multiplication of the values up to the 42 number. So that's an interesting way of uh, giving a handle to another function so that it can kill yourself. I'm not sure it's a good idea, but uh, uh, it illustrates what you can do by uh, transmitting tags as a, as an, well, tags are regular objects. They have nothing special about tags. You can do whatever you want, uh, whatever you usually do with an object. Um, so this one is, uh, I don't think I have time for, for going into these details. What is interesting in this is the notion of closure. So you, you see that this function returns a function. So uh, and then this function can be used later on. So uh, I'm not going to, to talk too much about that. I think we're running out of time. Uh, this is another thing, so a, a way towards futures. It's very easy to detach the execution of some you know, heavy calculations like x and y in that example do some st stuff, and then put a synchronization point where you wait until uh, there is something inside x and something inside y, and then you carry on. So this is, uh, this is not futures exactly, because you should do this transparently. So you use it 
you use X and Y, and whenever they're really needed, it's going to uh, block. But you can see how you can uh, build this because you can uh, hook the execution of or hook the the, um, uh, uh, the get uh, methods of X so that whenever it's really going to be uh, used, it's going to block until it's really defined. So this is an interesting uh, way of doing this classical problem. Okay. So that's it for the Herbie script language. I would like to show you a little bit what we do on top of Herbie as development tools, basically graphical development tools. And the main thing I will show you is uh, the, the um, finite state machine editor, the hierarchical finite state machine editor that we have, uh, which is, uh, again, a very typical way of describing behaviors for robots. So this is part of what we uh, call Herbie Studio. Uh, which is a suite of uh, well, a list of, of uh, applications that you can use to uh, design behaviors, design animations for a robot, uh, simulate them in an environment, or uh, simply create a lab to interact with your robot in an easy way. So um, this is the the application. So uh, I think I'm going to do a demo. It's very risky, but. Uh, I'm not afraid. So <laughs> uh, what you see here is a hierarchical finite state machine. So every single node that you see is a small piece of Ruby script that is doing something useful for well, a simple elementary action uh, uh, attached to this node, like looking for the ball or following the ball, whatever. And uh, the arrows that you see are transitions that are attached to a certain condition, whatever condition you want. So the idea is that you execute the code inside the node. And when the condition becomes true, you jump to the next node. That's it. And you have a hierarchical description, so you can have one node, which is itself described as a subgraph, and so on, as deep as you want. The thing is that I think the interesting thing uh, is not uh, this approach. It's already existing for many years. Hierarchical state machine is a, uh, you will find uh, hundreds of different applications doing that. The interesting thing here is that this program is generating Herbie code, so it's a code generator. And what you see here is just a way to represent your program in a convenient way instead of having a series of lists of, uh, of files. Uh, you represent it in a, in a way that makes more sense uh, 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 regarding uh, your application. And um, the interesting thing is, since it, it generates Herbie code, there will be a lot of things that you can do while the program is running by interacting with the robot, stopping some parts, and monitoring some values, and so on and so on. Also due to the client server architecture, where you can have maybe five or 10 persons connected on the robot and checking the different aspects of the, 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 the program running. This is very, very flexible and very easy. So let's try to do a, a demo. Uh, I had a video, but I think it's better to do a real thing. Here we are. So here we are executing this init node, which is basically making the robot stand up. And we're going to jump to, as soon as the work is ended, we're going to jump to the seek node. Here's the code. So it's a very simple code that is looking for the ball. So it's going to probably find <laughs> the, the chair as being a ball. So let's do that. So he found a ball. OK. So now he's uh, in this big node. And basically, he's trying to keep the distance with the ball. So if I want the robot to fall now, I just have to do that. <laughs> no, I won't do that. But uh, <laughs> So uh, what's happening here is you see the transition in real time. The way you can see that is because every node is, in fact, uh, 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 enclosed in a tag that you monitor. You remember the begin and end. So the application knows when it starts and when it stops. Maybe it will stop now, OK, <laughs> so I can speak. Uh, so um, uh, uh, the idea is that you can see in real time what happens because you are, you are in a client server kind of interaction with the robot, and you get the messages and what's going on. And the interesting thing is that, uh, well, uh, maybe I should detail what's happening while it's seeking the ball, when it sees the ball. Then it barks. You, you see the green node is the start node. Everywhere where you have a green node, it's where it starts. So it starts by barking. And then it goes to keeping the distance, which is a very simple you know, Herbie line that says, uh, I loop the fact that if the, the ball is too small, the ratio is too small, then I walk for three seconds. Otherwise, I, I wait. Uh, so this is keeping distance. If I move the ball away from the robot, it's going to move uh, and walk towards it. And this is a turn to ball, basically. The expression is here, you see, uh, no, here, up, 
Uh, basically, it says when the angle of the head is too great, greater than 50 degrees, then it has to turn its body towards the ball. So if I do that, here, it's going to turn its body towards the ball. There's a lot of red things in the, <laughs> in the landscape, so it's disturbing is a ball detection. But anyway, uh, you get the idea. And if I, if I hide the ball, then it's going to bark again and seek for, for the ball again. Seeking is just two things that happen in parallel, turning the head around, and after every, every I don't know, two seconds, turn my body for uh, 30 degrees. And these things are happening in parallel, and guess what? It's done with an end, simply an end. So you have a parallelism inside the node, because it's written in Erby, and of course parallelism uh, at the level of the nodes, because uh, <laughs> it's impossible. The robot is moving all the way. So I'm going to do something. I'm going to stop it. So let's do this. It stopped. So how did I do that? I just press the stop, the, the pause button here. And as you guessed, there is a, a tag that is uh, enclosing everything that is generating, all the code generated. And when I press this button, it's just doing a tag.freeze, which is temporarily freezing everything inside. So the program in that case. And if I press play again, then the robots is then following the ball and doing the the behavior again. So, well, stop it. <laughs> um, what else to say? Well, yes, you can, uh, you know, it's what you expect. You can have uh, happy eyes, like it's this typical behavior that we have predefined, and you can connect it. And uh, Well, you cannot have anything before in it, so it's a stupid thing to do, but uh, you can connect it, uh, I don't know, somewhere here. And uh, you can design like that uh, your application very easily. We will add also the fact that you can, of course, run uh, several graphs at the same time. There's no problem doing this. And uh, you can very easily uh, build more and more complex uh, behaviors that you enclose in a big node and use as an elementary node later on. OK, so uh, back to the presentation. Um, of course, everything we do is going uh, to run cross-platform on Linux, Mac, uh, or Windows. Uh, so this was the video. I'm going to skip it. No, I can't skip it. Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, the, the other application, it's very, very classical thing also. It's an animation generator. So every line you see here is actually a variable, which happens to be a motor in that particular case. And then you assign some uh, movements on every motor. This is a timeline, what you see on the x-axis. And you can have oscillation, you know, pass, and so on. Uh, you can also record. So if you press the record button, the little red thing here, uh, then you uh, will move your robot freely, and it's going to record the series of position. Then you get a series of points that you can edit to customize your movements and so on. The interesting thing here, uh, again, the original thing is that it's generating Erby code, of course. So you can import this as a node in a previous application, for example, or simply share it with friends or whatever. Uh, so it's Part of the suite is integrated in the Ruby Studio to make life simpler when you design animations. And this is a very nice uh, program, also it's Ruby Lab. So the idea here is that you can drag and drop some uh, widgets and have them. Um, uh, I don't have time to make a demo, I think. Mm, no, I don't have time. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, the, the idea is that you type the name of a variable, and then depending on its type, it's going to appear as a slider if it's a, a real number, or uh, it's going to appear as an image if it's a video, or it's going to appear as something else, depending on what it is. And then you can move this widget wherever you want on what we call a layout. Save this layout for later use. And, um, and then use this as a way to interact with your robot uh, or your application. Again, I don't think this is necessarily limited to robotics. Um, you can add buttons also. So when you press a button, you can add the script that will be an Arabic script that will be executed at that time or when you release the button. So you can redesign a remote controller if you want uh, for your robot. And again, there could be five or 10 people connected at the same time with their specific controller to look at specific things on what's happening on a complex robot or complex application. OK, uh, so just to conclude, uh, I, I said something very ambitious at the beginning. We want to make all robots compatible and make them uh, uh, speak the same language. So where do we stand today? It's been two years that the company exists. The technology, I started it, I think, six years ago. Uh, so where do we stand now? Um, 
basically we have 15 or 16 different robots. There are 14 on the, on the picture. Uh, so there are about 15 robots already compatible. So I'm sure you recognize some of them. If you, I've seen that there are a lot of people uh, interested in Lego uh, in uh, Google. So uh, we, we are compatible, for example, with the Lego Mindstorm, <coughs> with the Nao robot, which is replacing the, uh, the Ibo to the Robocup. Uh, a fantastic French robot, by the way. You should have a look. Uh, a lot of robots from Japan, the Ibo, of course, the historically, Korean robots, Canadian robots robots for university and so on. Well, uh, this HRP2, which is a human-sized robot. Uh, basically, we can run with uh, any robot that is capable of you know, accepting C++ compiler code. So that's uh, the idea. Um, we also have partnership with uh, uh, companies that develop these very typical uh, technologies that are needed in robotics uh, and in many other domains, like a voice synthesis, recognition, object recognition, face detection, and so on. and uh, OpenCV uh, interfaces and recently localization to have the robot knows where it is uh, in the in the room. So these are of course U objects, the things that you can plug in Erby and they appear as objects and you can then immediately script them and use them in your application. As I mentioned, there's uh, this company Aldebaran Robotics, which is uh, selected to replace the IBO to the RoboCup. Uh, RoboCup is probably you know, but it's uh, one of the main event, if not the main event of robotics every year. Uh, that uh, you know, you have robots playing soccer, and this is a, uh, a, a test for uh, um, universities to uh, measure it, it, uh, themselves uh, uh, against each other for uh, developing the best AI to have robots cooperating and uh, and winning a soccer game. So this is going to happen in China in a few days now uh, this year. And there are, there's RB inside this robot, and there's also an online competition, which is a robot stadium, uh, which is going to take place there. Well, a lot of people using it. So just to say that there are very serious people using RB for very complex uh, applications. RoboCup is a, has a big challenge, and they are developing very complex uh, code. Uh, in terms of community, there is a website called Herbiforge where you can exchange with people. Uh, there's a forum and all those things. Recently, we also have uh, started a dev blog to talk about more technical issues and where we talk about a preview, for example, on Herbie 2. This was uh, more or less Herbie 1.5 that we, you've seen. Uh, not exactly. Some parts were already uh, taken from Herbie 2, but basically we're going to release uh, Herbie 2 soon. There's a roadmap. I think that's the last slide. Um, and you can download Derby for all, most of the robots you've seen before uh, on our download page for free. Uh, so that's the roadmap. Uh, we had a technical preview in uh, April. We are now running for the beta in September and uh, hopefully early 2009. We will have the, the version of 2.0 working. The big difference with the current version, uh, 1.5 and 2.0, 2 is the core language itself, so uh, the way objects are, are represented and all those things. So, uh, that's the, the big difference. For example, everything is an object in 2.0, while well, 1.5 was not, uh, was built for many years with layers and layers and layers. So we have redesigned the core language in 2.0, which makes it, uh, I think, uh, interesting because it gathers the, well, the experience of many years of language design that uh, exists today in the world and some new ideas on parallelism and even based programming. And you can test it uh, right now. I think uh, it's a uh, it's working. Uh, you can go on demo.gustai.com. It's a work in progress, but you can go there and you will have a shell and you can start to do some Herbie code and type it and test it as you want. Uh, of course, if you want, you can contact us and we, we can uh, uh, give you some versions and li listen about your projects and see what you would like to see in, uh, in terms of features and so on. So to summarize, um, it's a parallel and even based coordination language. That is, the ambition is to be a small piece of your application that is coordinating the rest. Uh, you're not going to write everything in Erby. I think maybe a typical Erby project will have only, I don't know, five, ten percent of Erby code, maybe. The rest being C++ and other things. So it's perfectly normal. That's its, its job. Um, it has some capabilities to monitor ongoing parallel code. Uh, we introduced the idea of tag-based debugging features, and we will work a lot on that to improve and integrate it with the uh, graphical applications that you, you've seen, uh, which is called Urbit Studio. Uh, I think that's it, and uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions. Uh, thank you very much.
Yes. What is your model for condition evaluation? So exactly what you mean. Uh, well, you've got these conditions that oh, uh, fire randomly uh -huh. and make that happen. Okay, so the, the key thing is that, of course, we don't spend all the time reevaluating all of the time. Uh, there are hooks that are, the, the evaluation is passed. Uh, whenever we see a variable, we say to the variables, hey, there is somebody that integrates you in the expression that calculates this trigger. So please let him know whenever this is a change, whenever you are changed, so that you can uh, reevaluate. So in principle, uh, you can have, uh, as long as your memory can handle it, you can, could have uh, thousands of uh, at. If there are no reason to reevaluate it, then so it's not going to take any CPU. So, mm -hmm. the, so the C++ connection then is a fairly heavyweight object that can keep track of these lists of things to, mm -hmm. to respond to. Uh, the, so the, if, I, if I had C++ get a controlling motor, uh -huh. and I want to hook that up, yeah. then I've got to somehow respond to all of those. Mm. Well, the, in, in your object, uh, the, the library, you have something called uvar, which is a, another object inside that enables you to make a bridge between your C++ code and RB. So whenever you have a X uvar within your U object, it's going to appear on, as a member X in your object. And it's going to know about, in both ways, you can be notified whenever X is changed on the C++ side. And of course, RB knows whenever you change something on X. So this is completely integrated, and in particular with the, the uh, uh, the hooking mechanism I mentioned before. So you should not have to worry about it. You, well, if you do some pure C++ things and RB knows nothing about it, then uh, you, you, there's no miracle, of course. Yeah? Uh, what robot would you recommend if you want to try it out? Uh, it's a difficult question. There are a lot of robot company uh, listening. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it depends on your budget. That's the first uh, question. Some well, the, the price range is from uh, two or three uh, uh, hundred dollars to two or three thousand, or even more for research robots. Uh, so I think I, I've seen you have a lot of Lego. That's a good uh, example. Lego Mindstorm. There's also the Bioloid, which is a uh, more maybe more um, uh, uh, motor-centered approach, where you have motors that you you know assemble. I don't know if you know this. It's a nice robot. If you have also, uh, if you can wait, the beginning of the year, there will be this uh, humanoid robot uh, uh, from uh, Liberan, which is, a, I would say, a bit like the Ibo in the sense that it's a complete robot with a lot of capabilities, embedded CPU and so on. Uh, but I'm sure I'm forgetting some very interesting robots. So uh, there are a lot, and that's the good news. And we believe that it's the beginning of a big industry, by the way. That's why we're doing all this. We think that there will be a robot uh, in every home, uh, maybe in three, five years. I don't know. And that's the idea. So you should not have a problem to find one. <laughs> and what's, what's your business model for all of this? Uh, the basic business model is uh, OEM licensing. So when a robot manufacturer wants to embed RB, then we make a deal so that he can have his, uh, the RB engine inside the robot. But we're also working now on applications. This is the next step. I'm not going to talk about it right now, but we're working hard on building stuff on top of Herbie so that, um, well, if you're not an engineer or hobbyist or somebody who somehow is interested in programming the robot, uh, you can have access to very nice applications that are based on Herbie. And uh, so that's the, the next step. Is the software available? Uh Free of charge or not? The studio well, as, as I said, you have to contact us, but we, we are going to release some uh, free available versions for everyone, but this is in, in progress. So it's the, the answer is there is no problem. Just contact us and we are going to give you everything you need, uh, especially if you're a university or a club. There is a free academic and club support program where we provide Herbie for uh, universities. If you're a business interested in, interested in using Herbie in the application you develop, then just contact us and uh, we will make it smooth. But the goal is, of course, to have a free version of RB available, if possible, uh, depending on the, the business model in particular. But this is, uh, yeah, for non-commercial use, typically, that should not be a, an issue. Yep. How much of the RB engine runs on the actual target, the robot itself, and how much runs on your controlling host? And is there a, a, a porting kit or anything like that to bring up on your own robotic platform? Uh, so the, the, the question is uh, whether uh, Herbie is running inside the robot or not. Is that correct? That's uh, yeah, or, or 
Okay. Well, it, the, the answer it depends on the robot. For example, I, I cited a few uh, um, robots like uh, I don't know, Bioloid or, or Mindstorm. Herbie cannot be inside. Uh, so we have Herbie on the remote computer, and Herbie remote controls the robot. For more advanced robots, like the Ibo or uh, the Nao robot, for example, then Herbie is inside, and you don't have to, well, you don't need an external computer to, to control it. And is there a, a part of the or any systems if you wanted to bring that to your Is there? Sorry, uh, like if, if you had your own robotic platform, is, yep. is there a part of the or something to bring up the execution engine on your robot instead of having to use the the limit the, the 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 minimum size of the the CPU that is required that's what you mean, or the operating system. Well, basically, if you can run Linux and you have uh, one or two hundred megahertz on an ARM platform, for example, that's a typical example where it works. Well, I'm sorry, I don't I really understand. Uh, if we can buy the the engine for a commercial application, the answer is yes. Is that your question? Well, my question is just the source available so that you can oh, the source, okay. for a, a different architecture. For the moment, the source is available for all the things that connects Erby to other languages, like U-Object Architecture or the lib Erby. I didn't detail that. Uh, these are GPL, open source. But the heart of Erby so far is not open source. We have not found a way that we could at the same time sell it as OEM and at the same time have it uh, open source uh, GPL, for example, or other. So the current situation is no, there is no access to the source, except in some contracts where you know industrial robots or things like that for certain cases, we can have an agreement with the company and give access to the code, source code, but it's in specific cases and it's, it has to be discussed. But we know that uh, a language uh, should probably be open source if he wants to grow and, and extend his, uh, his uh, capability, well, its, it's audience and the, the, the community. So this is a, we are well aware of that. Yes? Um, how much work do the robot designers, manufacturers, or the operating system makers for the robot, how much work do they have to do in order to support Kirby? So how much work do uh, robot manufacturers have to do to support uh, being the robot? The way it's done is through U objects. So you design U objects that are um, like, for example, a motor objects that is a proxy to whatever API is in the robot. So that's completely in the hands of the manufacturers. He knows what he, how, how to control the motors. And then you design a U object that is going to wrap this into a standard way of presenting things like dot .val. Uh, headpan.val, if you've seen in the, in the examples, for example, the .val is the typical way to access the value of the model. So you have a bit of standards uh, that we have designed, so the way it should be. But then when, once you've done that, you plug the U object and you have access to your model. And you make some instances on the Herbie side, so you specify uh, this generic model, you, you, you instantiate it for the different motors available in your robot. So how long does it take? Uh, it, it depends on the complexity of the underlying API and what the robot uh, has uh, as a way to be controlled. I mean, uh, if it's a simple C function that you call to set the motor, it's well, in, a, in a week, it's OK. Now, sometimes it's a very complex architecture where you have, well, it can be very, very complicated, or it can be in Japanese undocumented, or those kind of things. So in that case, it could be. Uh, several months, so it really depends on what you have. But the principle is easy. You build an object that makes a proxy to your motors or your camera. Yes? <laughs> is there a um, software robot simulator that you use or that works with it? Mm. Is there a software for simulation that we can use with Erby? Uh, the answer is yes, there are several. Uh, one of them is a Webot, which is a, a very famous and very uh, used for more than 10 years now, a simulator for robotics. Uh, and uh, we are a partner with the company. So basically, you can have Erby for Webots, which means that uh, you're going to make a program uh, for your simulated robot that is going to run on localhost, typically. So that's where the simulator is. And when you want to put it on the real robot, you just change the IP address of the Erby engine, and that's it. Of course, uh, there are some limitations on how accurately you can render the physics of the world and those things. So this is common to every simulation. But uh, well. Apart from that, uh, the way uh, the program is done is exactly the same. So 
Webots is an example, and we plan to support more and more uh, simulation environments. The, the key word of what we do is technology neutral. So we don't want to bind to one. Uh, we want to be compatible with every operating system, every languages, every simulator, and be really a bridge that enables you to use those things. OK, well, I think there is no more questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.